Hey, it's Chris. Ranking and reviewing November 2022, a year ago. Huge, huge names launched on crowdfunding. Massive projects. Three of them breaking $3 million all within a month. Just massive names, massive IPs, and massive amounts of, you know, people just throwing cash around like they, you know, wanted to get rid of it because it was burning a hole in their pocket. How do you feel about it now, a year later? Let's rank them, let's review where things are at, and let's tell you my feelings and maybe make some people mad at me at the same time. As always, that's what's fun to do. Not that I necessarily, I kind of like doing it sometimes. Anyway, not purposefully too much. Let's go. First up, this is one that I had on my radar that I ended up passing. I just couldn't do it from Contention Games. I mean, Slay the Spire, right? Cooperative deck building taking the video game IP and slapping it to the tabletop in a relatively unique way. But I just looked at it and I said, that's a lot of money, $100 to get the base game. Another what, like 50 bucks to get in with the expansion, 45-ish, but you get play mats, coins, and a claw pack and a bigger box to score the play mats. I, no, nope, 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 can, can pass and kind of see where this one goes. But it raised just a hair under four, million dollars with over 20,000 backers. That's insane. Contention Games pulled this one back and pulled this one back and pulled this one back until they were happy with it. And again, I hope it's successful and I hope people like it, but I have some serious trepidation about a multiplayer version of this. You know, when I look at a game like this, it reminds me of 2021's Skyrim from Modias right? Where people are like, oh, it's going to take a classic solo game. It's going to port it to the tabletop. It's going to make it a mate. No, no, it didn't. It still a solo game. Best as a solo game. And I worry about this because you're going to have to have a dynamic there that is unnatural for the game in the first place. And is it going to be, as with all of these video game ports over to the tabletop, far enough away from the video game that you're not just going to go, well, I'd rather play the video game, but is it also going to be close enough that it appeals to the diehardists, if you will? And I don't know. That's, that's a little crazy to think about, but it's just something that is interesting. Now, supposed to be, supposed to be in your hands next month. Is it though? So we go back over here, right? You can still late pledge. Nearly 30,000 backers. Sorry, not just over 20. That's a huge difference there. The problem is, the latest update at the time I'm filming this, delayed. They're not even starting production. And the thing is, it's not that they're going to be starting it soon. Production at the earliest down here, so you don't miss it because of my head being in the way. April. Woof. Woof. It's going to be a year overdue, folks. It's going to be a year overdue. Now, again, crowdfunding. Who cares, right? I just hate seeing that. It means a lot of this stuff, and especially with an IP, gets tangled up from the legal side of things with the IP holders in the first place. Not that it's necessarily bad. I mean, I want all this stuff to be crystal clear, taken care of, and, you know, smoothed out so that you have an amazing game. But it has enough uh, issues from the non-production side of things that... I just don't know. This is another one that I love this video game, but is it going to be something that I can justify getting right now as a tabletop game? No, it's, it's going to be high on my trade list once it's out, but I really want to know, does it play well at the two, three, and four player counts, right? Is it going to be an Aeons and equivalent in that sense? Because let's not kid ourselves. As I did with some of the other games talking about previously in November of 2021, you know, it's not only got to be good, it's got to be better than its predecessors and compatriots that are doing similar things. And sometimes good, very good even nowadays, is not enough. That's my biggest concern. And that's not a bad, I and mean, again, I'm not going to say it's going to be a bad game by any means. I think it has a real, real solid chance to be one of the best video game ports to the tabletop. But... Let's be frank here, you know, the ceiling is pretty high. The basement is probably not as high as I'd like to. I think there's more of a Skyrim, Mage Knight, too many bones potential, where it's still really good at solo, but it's maybe not the cooperative experience you want as a whole. So, I don't know. That one has mixed feelings, mixed blessings at this point as well, and I have no clue where that's going to go. Next one up. Speaking of big funders, though. You know, almost three and a half million, 3.3 .3 million pounds. 
only 14,000 backers though. So nearly the same amount of money, half the amount of backers. You know what that means price point wise, right? It means a freaking metric ton. What are we talking about? Steamforge, Elden Ring. Not Elden Ring, but Elden Ring. A small portion of it new. For the price of a PS5 and Elden Ring, you could buy part of the Elden Ring experience as a board game. Uh, unfortunately, you know, there's not a lot of info. There was a lot of FOMO with this. There was a lot of IP hand wringing. What are we gonna get? And I don't know, did people get what they wanted? Did people really feel like they got their money's worth? Are they feeling like they're getting their money's worth with part of this game? I mean, I think for some people it brought up a little bit too close to home PTSD of Dark Souls, but for a lot of others, clearly it wasn't an issue. And with Steamforge, they do some exclusivity. So you're gonna pay a premium if you want to get it later now because again their exclusivity is mostly just price point nowadays it's not totally gameplay content but it was a little bit of both and they did this triple pledge thing where they called it you know the entry which really one was unless you living outside of north america made zero 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 percent chance of you getting it the core pledge which is going to cost you over 150 pounds just to get in and then the all-in which was you know 364 pounds with shipping of like, I don't know, like another 75 bucks or something like that, right? Delivery of May 2024. Okay, that's great. Unfortunately, so we go over to the latest update here, and I guess it's okay. And if you go over to the GameFound page, the GameFound page has some of the updates along the side of this, and the pledge manager is going to be closing in December. But it makes you go, why would you even get in, or why would you even have that pledge level to begin with, right? of pledging a half metric ton of money or the equivalent of a PS5 during the campaign, if you can get in over a year later for the same or very, very nearly the same cost, I mean, it behooves you to never pledge more than a, whatever's gonna get you in the pledge manager in the first place. Because if you're looking at this right now and going alongside the things mentioned previously of not being included in the all-in and having to be nickel and dimed another 50 or $100 or whatever it is, right? Uh, you know, we've seen that with a few other campaigns like Marvel Zombie Side, where people have been like, what? Shipping is going to be this? I'm all out, even though I've already spent $400. Another 40 is too much for me. Like that dichotomy is always weird from a mindset standpoint. And I just don't get it. Now they're still making gameplay content. So there's no talk of production here at all in the latest last, I think, two updates. So getting it by May 2024, the original predicted date is absolutely zero chance. It's just whether or not you're going to get it in 2024 at all at this point. And I guess that's okay because I'd rather have it better than early, but I don't know. Your mileage may vary. The jury is still out on that one. I don't necessarily feel as encouraged. I, frankly speaking, hate doing these lookbacks and roundups with companies that are still doing stuff in terms of essentially QA here, you know, months or even a year post campaign. Because what it tells me, and again, not that it, you can't do that right, well, don't get me wrong, don't twist those words too far out of context, but what it tells me is that people are so desperate for the funding initially, they come with a completely unfinished product in the first place. And you can say a lot of what you want about crowdfunding being a pre-order store. This also shows that people are just going for the money without even the full product with it in the first place. So the pre-order is not even necessarily the order that you're gonna end up with by the time it gets to you. And that should scare you, which is why going back to earlier's point of don't pledge anything but getting you into the pledge manager should be your main MO. Because again, you have 13 months since the time of this ending funding to decide whether you want it or not at this point, knowing that there's more out there. If you're in for 500 bucks right now, I mean, you can get a refund, but at this point, you're probably gonna lose 10 or 20%. 10 or 20% on another campaign project like a flat out games, right, of 30 bucks. Oh, I'm out three bucks. Oh, no. 50 or $100 out because of the refund fees. Whew. That'll make you think twice of doing that again, right? That's some smarts. Then we go on to the what the nostalgia raising this much money factor side of things at this point with Might and Magic? The board game? I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, cool video game, guys, when I was growing up, right? It reminds me very much of Simon's He-Man. 
Let's play off the nostalgia. Let's play off the miniatures. Let's play off of the deluxe that goes with it. But is it actually going to be any freaking good? I mean, that's what scares me with any game that plays off of that, right? Is that you're kind of going with a crapshoot when it comes to the gameplay. Don't get me wrong. Like I said, it's pretty to look at, right? But you have no clue if this is good, right? It was satisfying. Ready to get this back to the table. Well, I don't know, right? Hex-based, card-laying, Uthia light-esque game? I don't know. Do you have any clue what the gameplay flow is going to look like in this? And I think the tricky point was it had an odd player count that you were sort of doing uh, the dynamic with. Open world, modifiable, RPG, uh, town builder, all in one. Right? Does that scare you, seeing how much is there? And again, miniature, miniature, Azure Pledge only, content, content, content. Asymmetric Commander expansion down here. Asymmetric Town expansion uh, right here. Uh, just tons of stuff that I go, what is this all doing? Does that look like a lot of iconography and a lot of things to keep track of? That's what it does to me at, these, at this point. And I'm looking for less is more nowadays with some of these. And again, this is a lifestyle price point as well as a lifestyle learning game. Again, not that it's going to be difficult to learn, but you're not going to be able to pull it out and play it if you haven't played it in the last month or two again. 75, 119, 169, 199, 234, and a 234 with a big box. Too much. Too much of a price point choosing at this point as well. Now, <laughs> you can get it shaded too. Latest update back in October at the time of me filming this. Pledge manager still open! Again, that's not great when you're a year out. And they said wave one was supposed to be shipped by the end of this year. Wave two, second quarter of 2024. Do you think any of that's going to be happening? Now, again, it looks like they've got some white box production, which I guess is kind of okay. But I would make the argument you're going to be lucky if wave one is by when wave two was supposed to be arriving. And you're lucky if you're getting wave two by the end of 2024. So do you like throwing money into the void and seeing when the product actually comes back to you? Because that's what a lot of these big projects are nowadays. We'll step away from my cynicism for big box campaign miniature games for a little bit, even though I love the idea of them as a whole. And let's go over to the Euro side of things. Let's go to Fantasia games and let's see where Unconscious Mind is. In case you're not familiar with this Freudian-esque Euro style game, had about three different boards you're gonna be dealing with, multiple elements on each board, trying to cohesively manage them in sort of a, well, Freudian style of mechanical approach. And it did really, really well. For a heavier Euro style on crowdfunding, it raised over a million pounds. That's not insignificant. And what's even more impressive is that it had 12, nearly 13,000 backers. Now, it's supposed to be delivered by the end of the year. Now, unfortunately, when we go over here to the crowdfunding page, well, there's post Essen results and the fact that it's not going to be anywhere near done by the end of the year. So you're probably looking at the usual six-month overage. There was one part of this game when I played it, I said that I didn't really feel like fit as well, mechanically speaking. And with Euro games that tend to just be, you know, especially on crowdfunding, sprawling, right? That's my fear. There's just too much even on this side of things. You know, we talk about it on the miniature side of things with all the iconography and all of that text on Might and Magic there. But the same thing is somewhat true on this style. So it can have that. They say at the bottom here that two months before production, and then, you know, you're going to be looking at somewhat near probably the end of the year before production starts. So yeah, six months. This one's going to be a great test of the market when it comes out to see how it compares to the other heavier worker placements and not Lesterda esque by any means, but sort of that midway overall. So again, no freaking clue how people are going to feel about this one when it actually gets there. So then let's go over to Brotherwise games. And, you know, I have a relatively nice track record with Brotherwise. I kind of like their Mario Kart Dungeon Kart one they put out on crowdfunding earlier in the year. I really like Castles by the Sea. It was, what, top 10 from 2022. But Empire's End was sort of one that I really liked the idea of before it came to crowdfunding. And when I saw the actuality of it on the crowdfunding page as sort of this engine building, auction bidding, you know, get disasters to get powers, but also like a self-flagellating uh, mechanism in order to get those powers. I don't know. It sort of gave me a little bit of, I'm not sure this is the right thing for me. So I don't really know. It's in the process of being fulfilled. It didn't do 
super fantastic. Like, I was hyped up for it, but maybe a lot of people had the same feelings that I did when it actually hit fruition. Almost 4,000 people, which is still relatively impressive, and $178,000, but I don't know, right? I don't hear anyone talking about this one either. Is it going to be to take that? Is it going to be just two head-to-head? -head? I, I know they like John DeClaire's mechanisms in some of the other games like Dead Reckoning and the previous ones that use that uh, transparent card layering system that they've got here. A lot more deluxification, a little bit of upgrade in terms of gameplay, and it turned out for me just, again, to be a, why am I getting this on crowdfunding? And the answer was absolutely no reason whatsoever, and we'll see. At the time of me filming this, it's in the process of being fulfilled. So, I mean, we'll see shortly. Board Game Geek has a 7.2, but it's got 186 rating, so who cares about that right now? But again, if you're going to look at this maybe six months to a year from now, similarly, where is it going to fall? And that's sort of the, I have no idea with this one as well. And again, just like with the previous couple, if you don't know, the answer is always no. No. And then we went over to The Last of Us from Themeborn, this very much black and white aesthetic from the Escape the Dark series that they put out, riding the coattails of the TV series after it came out, I believe, if I'm timing that correctly, with The Last of Us based on the popular, super popular video game in the first place and the critically acclaimed TV series now. It's just got its own unique aesthetic appeal. Again, I don't judge things by aesthetic appeal, but it definitely is a small factor nowadays. But... The gameplay, I was kind of like, okay, card-driven, narrative, a little bit of just complete, complete, utter randomness. Different every time, it says. That's how it describes it. But it sort of gave me more of a Dead of Winter vibe with a lot of the randomness and a lot of the choosing and a lot of going back and forth. Again, I just looked at it and said, I'm not sure this is going to be a good fit for me whatsoever. I mean, I like the fact that it's a quick setup. That can't be understated. It's social. Uh, I hate it when stuff gets social in that sense. It either means potential, you know, alpha gaming, or it just means, you know, too social social. And I looked at it and said, deluxifications, deluxifications, deluxifications. This is a game where it's heavily card driven. And I, again, don't see the need for miniatures. I don't care whether or not it's colored. I don't really like the aesthetic, but I've got plenty of games in my collection that the aesthetic is, you know, not great or super awesome to begin with. But again, just even looking through this page, I'm like, okay, there's not a whole lot to necessarily attract me. And... I just was completely, you know, sort of ambivalent about it, to be frank with you. And it's going right now, 9,700 people, you know, nearly a million dollars, which was insane. But how much of that is based off of the IP? If this would have been a completely different IP, would you have had people clamoring for it in the same sense? Now, it's great that they said game development's finished and production's begun, but it's still going to be delivered in March, which again, so just over a month prior to me filming this, they put this out and that's awesome, I guess. You know, this is always number one above all else. And I like the fact that it is where they want it to be. But this is also the concerning trend of why most Kickstarters or crowdfunders are late nowadays is because, as I said previously, they just come with a completely unfinished product in the first place. Core ideas, core samples of things. And yeah, I know some of that's a business side of things. But as a consumer, well, I can wait too, just as much as you can wait to finish the game, I can wait to buy the game. Will it be good? I have no idea. This is one that I would be happy to have someone bring over on game night and try out, sort of like Return the Dark Tower, where I was like, yeah, this is a nice game. I don't want to own it, but this is a nice game. Two more here, because otherwise this video is going to get way too long. Brother Ming Games. Big fan. And they did React, the Arts of War. Re, semicolon, act. Uh, which is based on the mechanism of reacting within the dueling style of the game, where you've essentially got, you know, just a very limited supply and type of cards, and you're going to be metagaming in a Yomi Battlecon way with more of a grid-based system of manipulating. And each of these characters gave you different ways to manipulate. I mean, Brother Ming has put out some of the stuff straight to retail that I've previously covered. They put out the Genshin Impact game, as well as the Fire Emblem game. I like the Genshin Impact. It's probably one of the hardest, if not the hardest deck builder I've ever played. I actually have been meaning to do a review on it here in the near future. But React was more up my ilk, right? Because if you've heard me say anything on this channel, I'm a big fan of the Yomi's, the Battlecons, the Exceeds, this style. And this was nice. The biggest issue I'll say is because Brother Ming is a smaller, like one person company, <laughs> essentially almost, that it's expensive. And they went with 
deluxified in a different way with the acrylic standees, which personally speaking, I think look better. I will always prefer these over any gray, white, blue, purple, or green chunks of plastic. It just has more of an aesthetic value. It's very, very spatially driven though. That's probably the biggest upside and downside of this one if you're not a fan of some of those others, right? Because you're basically going like this, whereas this one, it's really manipulating and you can just have swing and misses and you can have some, whoa, can't believe I didn't think of that or whoa, can't believe you did that and I have no way of dealing with it. And so this is probably gonna be more meta than even say an Exceed or a Yomi. It's gonna be more in the lines of a battle con based on your player choice. When I did the campaign video, I felt like one or two of them looking back may have been a little bit not well situated for each other, right? Like sometimes you just have a bad matchup and definitely the learning curve and definitely the, I like this type of character and how they manipulate the battlefield and how they manipulate my players, how they manipulate my pawns, my minions on the field in the first place. And there were actually some uh, additional characters i believe that were all unlocked and so there was an expansion to go along with it i'm excited to see what they can do with this though it's not going to get the acclaim it's not going to necessarily get the hype that some of those other ones uh sometimes do but if it can really be streamlined for what it is again not overly complex you can't make this too much of a barrier to get in right like ivion or even the other one um ignite where just just too much going on in the first place right you got to distill down to what makes yours unique and best. And so that's why I'm excited to see what this can do. Now, delivered here, here in uh, what time frame here? November 2023. So where are things at? We go over to the latest update here. The rule book is completely done. Uh, that means production is not yet underway, but the white sample is here. So again, you're not going to get this before the end of the year. You're probably going to be looking at, you know, mid to late quarter two. So... It's gonna be a higher price point. It's gonna be a little bit less easily accessible than say those other ones I mentioned, but it is gonna be offering something different if you are a fan of this in the first place. So again, I just hope it's not overly complex with some of these characters in the first place. And it's gonna be a, you know, a fantastic approach to the style. So we'll see. Last up was another one that uh, just came out of nowhere. And I think people really like the idea of, and this is why it always strikes home well, similar to a few of the others were covered, uh, Flyos Games, Werewolf the Apocalypse, Retaliation. No, I didn't just, you know, make up a few words and string them together. That was the name of their one to four player RPG dungeon crawl-esque game. And only 4,400 people, but, you know, about $700,000, good amount of money. And it's a dungeon crawl with miniatures, folks. It's got sort of the werewolf vampire-esque thematic incorporation. They're going, I believe, with an app-based system, if I'm remembering too, because they sort of did a little bit incorporation with their previous Vampire the Masquerade chapters, two or three expansions to go along with it. And we'll kind of see where it's going, because again, it was supposed to be delivered, you know, in about three months. So where are things at though? So when you so when you go over to the how to play, right? Cooperative, pack of werewolves, going at it about 30 minutes per player, 30 scenarios. That's a lot of scenarios that you have to have well-balanced. And you get to choose all of your attributes and you get to customize, which again, you know, makes me a little concerned, again, that you can just have too much of a customization, right? Like part of the video game side of things that makes it so nice is you can do that just quick, right? Like click, 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 done. And maybe not if you're having to do this every time with every person, especially with a group that doesn't stay the same. The basic gameplay, you know, is a lot of skill check narrative based open world situation. It gives me sort of an oath sworn vibe only with more of a narrative, if you will. I don't know, though. Is it truly unique? Is it really going to be so much upkeep that you're just going to have to deal with it like Aeon Trespass Odyssey? I don't have a clue. I don't have a clue with this one either. This is a lot of money for a lot of plastic. And you can see why nowadays I say that because these just mechanically speaking, you can't even tell how different this one is going to be on the page compared to the half a dozen other dungeon crawlers that launched this past year. Yeah, a little nuance here. Yeah, a little nuance there. Uh, narrative campaign here. Upgrade RPG this. Upgrade RPG that. How do you tell what's right for you in that regard? Well, you can't. And then you start wondering and you start saying, well, I'm going to have to get in for 150 Canadian dollars even find out right now. Does that make you feel comfortable? No, that doesn't make me feel comfortable whatsoever for that price point. Because again, it's an unknown. If you say unique, well, okay, but unique again, like I've said previously, double-edged sword. Unique in a sense that you don't have anything like it. Unique in a sense that you don't have a 
forking metric clue whether or not you're going to like the way it's doing it in the first place. So we go over to the latest update here again, just at the very beginning of this month, and they give you a little bit of content update, which, hey, e, e, okay, well, gameplay is pretty much done, writing's pretty much done, artwork's pretty much done. How much of the other stuff though? E, okay, that's a lot of blank bars there before stuff gets done. And now translation, you know, if they're staggering the languages, sure. Proofreading, okay, yeah, you, you, you need a lot of that. But I have no clue where that actually means you're going to have it done, which clearly means you're not going to deliver at the estimated time of delivery. But does all of this stuff not being done put you quarter three, quarter four-ish, probably at earliest quarter four of 2024, if you're lucky? If everything goes right, if all of the miniatures work out fine, if all of the expansion content is all done in one wave, then I have no idea. So... It's a big gamble for this, folks. You, you gotta love this stuff. You gotta absolutely love it. And the problem is, you don't have hands on. And you can see why I get a little trepidatious now with anything triple digits, right? Like, anything triple digits better be something that you've played before almost on crowdfunding. And, and that's sad that it's turning into that, but you can see why with this video that you can have just hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of dollars tied up in stuff that's in the nebulous void that you don't even know if you're going to like, let alone not even in the process of coming to you yet, but still just hanging out there. And the longer that stuff hangs out there, the longer that the overhang and the, you know, costs rack up and the more of a chance of a mythic or a Peterson games that happens, you know, not that it's going to happen to any of these, but the odds just increase the longer that stuff takes, which is again, which is why I wish that people would come with more of a finished product in the first place. I mean, we didn't even talk about today because, again, we didn't have time. The Oceans expansion, Oceans Legends. Again, I thought that expansion was going to be adding something else. I love the second half of Oceans. It wasn't a span of the first half as much of the game in the first place. Uh, we didn't talk about either Circadians, the First Light, uh, Garfield's other, other one that hardly gets talked about. That had an expansion that we didn't cover, as well as the Tiny Epic Crimes that is, I think, kind of okay received. I have no idea where all the Tiny Epic ones are and how they rank and... I'm sure people cover that out there. And then also AEG Shake That City, where you have the little shaking thing and it puts them down in a nice grid for you. I don't know. No no appeal there for me. Rolling Heights, though, that was a good one. Anyway, so that's it. Ranking, I'm um, thoughting after, you know, a year. A year later on crowdfunding. It's getting harder and harder to back bigger and bigger stuff. At least for me. And... You know, I look at that as an evolution of myself, but an evolution of what the scene is putting out there, too, because I feel like as well, like I cover in the roundup on a weekly basis. Previews are domineering things, and it's going to make you harder and harder as a consumer to figure out what's right for you and be more than what's just a board game geek description in video content form. So that's it. November, in a nutshell, last year, going through things. Thanks for watching. Stay classy. Have a great day. Peace out.